Welcome to podcast number 48. Uh, once again, I appreciate everybody taking the time to listen to these and write in different uh, suggestions and, and topics. Um, the list keeps building. So as I promised earlier this year, uh, and I've been a little bit of a lazy ass on, is I promised uh, some more interviews. And today uh, I have a guest and it's, it's a great topic and it's something that people have uh, talked about a little bit or, or talked around a little bit uh, about, about their bike. And everybody's quick to wanting to, uh, you know, to put money in their bike and do stuff because we're all gearheads. I am as well. I like working on my motorcycle. That's, that's just part of how it is. Um, it's a different kind of uh, relationship than, than some of the other vehicles that we have. So um, this, uh, this podcast is, is really about um, you and your bike and what kind of relationship you and your bike have. And my guest today is uh, Rick Matheny. And Rick, um, I've, I've known sort of uh, for a while, um, uh, we, we say hi in the Moto America paddock quite a bit. Um, I've worked with one of his riders a little bit, um, Hayden Gillum. And uh, I like Rick because uh, Rick falls under the, um, the guise of uh, uncompromising prick. So uh, it, it, works out, it works out pretty good. So Rick, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yep. I've been called worse. Yeah, I, be I bet you have, just as I, I have. So just a quick little introduction on, on who you are and um, you know, sort of where you're at in the sport. Well, um, so I'm currently crew chief for the Cycle World Suzuki team with Hayden Gillum as a rider. Um, we've, this is our second year doing that. Um, we've got the new bike this year. Um, it's a really small crew and a really small budget relatively. And uh, we try to make, to do a lot with a little. And I've done that with Hayden with the exception of one year uh, since 2011 and tried to help him grow his career in the sport. But I've uh, been a crew chief in the AMA since 2005 um, and have worked for a variety of teams, but uh, I owned my own shop for quite a number of years, uh, working on street bikes and track bikes and race bikes and uh, had a couple of dynos and full on race performance shop. And uh, I've worked uh, doing transponders for the AMA. I've done a million different jobs in motorcycling, but um, that's my background. I've always loved motorcycles, and uh, right now I'm uh, comfortable with what I do in the sport as a crew chief, and I really enjoy it. And um, hopefully, maybe we can uh, give, give give out some advice today to help some people. Yeah, that that's it. So the first thing is, is we'll just we'll just jump right into this, um, and that's sort of the hallmark of what we do with these things: is we don't sit around and bullshit. We just kind of give people the the right information right now. So. With motorcycles, and as, as people have known me, I I, um, I I do compromise on some things, but there are some things I absolutely won't compromise with. So, why are motorcycles different? Um, I mean, what 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 makes a, sort of an uncompromising attitude different with a motorcycle? Well, versus, I, I think you mean versus a car yeah, or a truck. Or, yeah. Um, it's completely different because uh, a motorcycle in the wrong hands uh, with the wrong preparation can easily kill you. Um, a car, you've got a cage around you. If it if it breaks down, you pull off the side of the road. With a motorcycle, uh, something goes wrong, it puts you on your head, and it can be very dangerous. So preparation is really key. And um, working on motorcycles, whether it's street guys, track guys, whatever, uh, I take it extremely seriously because you, the the rider of the motorcycle, their life's in your hands at some point. Vir not not virtually, virtually, but literally in your hands, what you do. So procedure is really important and following a set procedure so that you don't miss something, but you double check everything and, and. They, do you use a torque wrench? Always. Yeah, that's so, uh, that's right. That, I mean, the difference between, between sort of an amateur and a professional, right? Is, you know. Count the number of torque wrenches you can tell how OCD a guy is and how much he follows I procedure. I love it, I love it. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and the torque wrench is really important. And uh, sometimes if you're in a hurry at the track and you got a red flag, you, you, the, you forego the torque wrench, but that's a special circumstance. But yeah, you, you you find if you try to get lazy and go, well, I know my hands and I can torque it to 10 Newtons with my hands and then something comes loose and you go, well, that didn't work. Yeah. And you can, you can do it a hundred times and the hundred and first time it really costs you. And we had a, for example, we had an issue with the, the new Suzuki this year that vibrates a lot more than the old one, a lot more vibration from the engine. Um, and we were having clutch cover leaks and it was because uh, we we're a little overconfident on putting the cover on. And so we just immediately went back to the torque wrench and you try, you know, you're in a hurry, you're putting the clutch in, you, you torque it with a T-handle, wasn't good enough. The thing was coming loose. So that teaches you again, don't, don't try to fall back on, on ways that you think you're confident with. Just use a torque wrench and follow the procedure. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And that's, again, you know, with, 
uh, one of the statements, right? Professionals are predictable and, uh, you know, professionals are consistent. Yes. So, um, question, so I got some questions for you, which we've already started to dive into. I, I put down here the, you know, biggest misconceptions, you know, a writers can make or, or, um, writers can do. And, and the first one that I, I did, and this is whether it's a street rider or a track rider, whatever it is, um, maintenance, right? So what are the things that you see sort of regarding maintenance that is maybe not done enough or done too much? Maybe, I, I don't know. So what, what are some of the things that you saw or you see on maintenance? Well, starting with street riders, um, chain is the first thing that you see completely mishandled chain and sprockets. Um, especially with a big bore bike, they, they, they go quickly. If you're going to, if you're going to go to a 520 kit on your, on your street bike, because that's what the racers do, you're going to go to aluminum sprockets, the rear sprocket on a big bore bike, a thousand. ZX-14 is going to wear very quickly. And people don't realize how fast they wear. We change them. We'll go through two sprockets a weekend here at the track. That tells you, okay, these guys are a full throttle on the limit, but that tells you how much, how quickly you can wear that aluminum down. But the chain, uh, the brakes, front brakes are on a street bike are almost always way too dirty. They don't work right when they're dirty. They get all that brake dust in them. The pistons don't retract. Then the wheel starts dragging and it gets worse because now it's, it's sloughing off more brake dust onto the wheel. And I look at street bikes or I'll go along here at the track and I'll look at people parking the street bikes and the brakes are dirty and you can clean them with simple green and water. Take, you know, best thing to do is take the pads out, clean them with simple green water, put them back on. It'll make a huge difference in the way the brakes feel. Um, but those two things and maybe, maybe tire wear, but, uh, but the, I would say that's the two most common things I see people completely miss when they're doing their maintenance. Got it. So, you know, we, we buy our motorcycles and it becomes this uh, intimate relationship that we have with them. And, and, uh, you know, we like to dress the bikes up. We like to buy parts for them. We like to do all these things. And I kind of wanted to separate, you know, adding, um, adding performance parts, whether it's a pipe or a shock or whatever, the, whatever the hell it is versus, you know, adding some, you know, other, whatever, um, uh, a G jaw. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so that's right. Adding some bling to it. So yeah, just, I mean, for instance, like one of the things that I don't like, I don't like aftermarket levers. I'm a big fan of OEM levers. I like the way they feel. I like how they work. And a lot of times when you get some of these aftermarket levers, they have a lot of play in them and the adjustments are, 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 are more coarse. And I, I don't get the feel that I want. The lever's very sharp on the edges. I, I don't get the feel. So I'm just, I'm just using that one as an example. Any thoughts on you know, adding, adding bling stuff, um, good, bad, um, any trends there? Well, it's just extra weight. You got to consider that if you're adding bling stuff. If it's not useful for performance, me as a purist, I'm like, I don't, I don't like it. I see it on street bikes and, and they, people like it. They like parking their bikes and look, having other people look sure. at them. I understand that. But w what you see most often is they'll add lighting, LED or any kind of lighting and the wiring is just done. It's unbelievable. I can't even believe it doesn't catch on fire sometimes. So you see wire and the whole, then there's 16 feet of wire stuffed up under the seat and the wired without a fuse. And that's really common with a lot of these bling things. You know, people put uh, different bar ends on and things like that. They're not performance oriented. They don't really affect it that much. Um, have fun doing that. That's fine. Um, I agree with levers. I mean, on our bike, our race bike, it's a stock clutch lever. We use Brembo yeah, I mean, and that's yeah, yeah. the stock Brembo lever, but yeah. you do see Chinese made levers that are very poor quality yeah. pot metal. And that's not a good thing. You have a little tip over how you, how are you going to get home without a brake lever? Yeah. Anything on uh, any of the performance stuff. I mean, like, I, I mean, I see, you know, a guy riding on the street, you know, guys, maybe a mid-level track day guy. And he's like, um, Rick, what spring, what spring is uh, Hayden running? Cause that's what I want to run on my bike, but I'm running a different, a different brand of shock. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to be real hesitant to answer that one. Um, the, I, I'll probably turn that around on the guy and say, well, what do you feel? And it's the same thing you say to a rider at the track. You have a different approach to it with a street rider, but rather than a, a rider who comes in and say, well, I want that set of forks and I want that shock. Uh, that's not what the crew chief or, or anybody like that. Uh, if you're giving advice to a, a track day guy, a street guy, you don't want that. You want to know you can figure your job is to figure out what to do with what they feel if they're telling you they want this spring or this shock because so-and-so ran it i usually back off and try and talk them out of that and oh, not necessarily talk them out of it but go well, why why do you want that what's what's the bike doing well nothing really yeah they just want it because they want it because they've seen it on the race bike yeah i know and, and we right that's right they and, I, and that's fine i get it but it's probably not going to work well for you at all no and, it, and and that goes back to if they if they want that i think it's great yeah right if they think they want that wonderful but if they're trying to get it from a performance aspect, 
I, I don't. Yeah, they're probably not going to be very happy on the street. They'll probably come come back up from a ride with that that set up a shot. Let's say a shock. Their kidneys are going to be killing them, and they're yeah. going to be laid up on the couch for a day. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's going to hurt. I mean, they're just not putting the same force into the bike. Right. It just doesn't. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. So, got it. All right. So this one is a, is kind of an open ended thing, but you know, from all the street riders that you've seen, and we've we've touched on it a little bit, but but you know, best thing a street rider can do. Again, very ambiguous question, but I mean, what are some of the things a street rider walks up to his bike in the morning? I mean, what's the what's what are some of the basic things he can do before he gets on his bike, gets off of his bike, and just just a general open-ended question? Do your tire pressure every time you ride. Every single time you go out, check your tires. I don't care if you rode it yesterday. Check your tires. I, I ride bicycles a lot. I check my tires on my bicycle because, well, they're 120 yeah, pounds and they leak I. air. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and it's the same thing on your motorcycle. And even on my cars and trucks, Once it's once a week for me. Um, I got tire monitors on my new truck. I still check my tires. It's just a habit. But the first thing you do, check your tire pressures. Um, check your chain wear, your chain tension. Um, and maybe every second or third ride or, or once a week or something, look at your front brake pads. Look at your rear brake pads. See how thick they are. You can usually take a flashlight and see them. Um, if you've got a lot of play in your throttle, get rid of that. Um, some play's good, but sometimes the cables will get loose. And then uh, clutch cable adjustment. Those are the basics I would go around and do. If, you're, if something goes wrong with your engine or, or something more major goes wrong, it's probably going to strand you. It's not something you can predict. Yeah. But all that other stuff, if you if you look at the, those few things I mentioned, you can probably make the whole the motorcycle more fun for longer if you just check all those little things. Yeah, and then again, it's part of this relationship that you're building with your bike. Yes. Right. So as you get to know it more and more, you realize, oh yeah, I got to check my chain every two weeks or week or whatever you you know you come up. And again, it goes, oh, I thought we just said this earlier, right? Professionals are predictable. Well, it's the whole you know consistency and and being predictable of those things. So. All right, so we talk about street riders a little bit. I love the idea of having a walk around, right? It's a, it's a pre-flight yes. is, is really what it is. Um, track riders. So I mean, a whole never a little bit of a ball game with, with track riders. So whether it's a track, you know, a track day rider or maybe it's a racer, same. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the first thing I tell guys about that is find you a, a, a good, well-known, well-respected suspension guy and get your bike uh, initial setup. Because you may think, you may read, you may re you go on the internet, you see, internet's okay, always right. yeah, the sag is going to be the X on the front and Y on the rear. And I'm going to, I know how to do that. I can do that and put it in my lift and, and do the sag. But honestly, a, a good suspension guy, guys in the business, um, Thermos Man and, and uh, uh, John Tyus and, and Dave Moss and all the guys around the country that are well known and respected for doing that. Find that guy, do an initial setup, get a little advice, pay him a little bit of money. It's so worth it. And it's cheap. It's 50 or or $100. And it is so much worth it. And if people go, well, he's not really doing anything. And yes, he is. He's he's assessing your motorcycle. And maybe he'll find something to go, well, this is way off. You've got to fix this. Or maybe he'll go, you're close. Go try this. Then you've developed a friend and a relationship with this guy. And you see him at the track. And he remembers you. And you, you can stop and say, hey, I'm, I'm having this issue. And there, you might get a little free advice out of it. So that 50 or $100 you spend for that initial setup goes further than that because you've developed a relationship with a guy who knows his stuff. Wait a minute. There's value in paying money? What the, <laughs> what the hell's up with that? Um, all right. So, yeah, suspension thing, I totally I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, what, uh, so what are some of the other things for, for um, you know, track riders or, or racers? What, what about log books, notes? Things oh, like absolutely. I mean, I keep copious notes at the track. And I, when riders ask me, um, how they can help their riding. I, I asked them first thing, are you taking notes? And most of the time the answer is no, or, or very, very poor notes. And I really enjoy it when I, I can find a guy that asked me, asked me for advice and I tell him to take notes and I find, I will, I'll walk over maybe and see him writing in a notebook. And it, it, it satisfies me to no end to a guy that took that advice because it's really important. You can go back um, you can see what's happening. If your friends buy the same bike, you can go then and they ask you for advice. You can look at your notes and you can look like you're smart and look like you're, you know what you're doing. And, and, uh, you might not want that, but, um, taking notes is really important and taking just more than you think you'd need Every, I, I, yeah, all I, the changes I, you make. And, and when you, there cannot be enough data as, as a guy that spends time looking over data and trying to make ECUs work. Um, you can never have enough information. Yeah. So quick story on that. So, you know, as these, these podcasts have gotten, um, you know, popular, which is great. And I thank everybody for that. 
uh, I had a guy come up to me and he says, um, God, Ken, your podcasts are great. He goes, you know, I listened to them over and over again. He goes, finally, he goes, I started taking some notes. I went, great. And then he goes, I started taking notes. And he goes, then I actually started doing it. And he's like, it's amazing what the improvement happens. But yeah, I mean, if you're not taking the notes and not writing it down, there's no inter internalization, right? For right. one. And no, there's just, there's just no basic record keeping, right? How do you remember day to day? How do you remember time to time weather conditions, you know, what your, your bike conditions, your gearing, well, wow, suspension settings. There's no way you'll remember it. It just won't happen. So yeah, you have to write this stuff down. So what else for track riders? Any, any last thing for them in general? We talked about, uh, uh, tire pressures are important and sometimes people get, get, uh, thrown the wrong way on tire pressures. You've got to, uh, first have an accurate tire gauge and check it because I've known people where the tire, but tire gauge is seven pounds off and they're wondering why they're having problems. And so you, you really need to make sure your tire gauge is calibrated somehow. Um, I use electronic tire gauges because they're totally accurate and they don't really go off unless you drop them. Um, and you see the MotoGP guys using the same ones that I use. And that's, we look up to those guys in this paddock. I see MotoGP guys, mechanics doing stuff. I'm doing that. Yeah, it, which is, it's, it's really funny. I, I love that you said that because, you know, the hallmark of the techniques that I teach are we're going to do what the best in the world are doing. Yes. Why? Because there's a better way they'd fucking do it. That's well, why. When I started out learning how to do this, Reg... O'Rourke was Matt Milan's mechanic yeah. and I watched him and I did everything that guy did. He was the first in line at tech. I said, well, I guess I got to be second in line and all the things he did and worked on that bike and brought Matt Milad and all those championships were stuff that I emulated and sort of the guy that I based my career on because those guys, Reg and, and John Asher and the guys that worked on Matt's crew when I started out were my heroes. So I would watch what they do and I do ex exactly the same. And, and that, that went a long way for me. That helped a lot. Yeah. Speaking of speaking of that, you know, Matt, um, I've got a good podcast coming up with Amar. Um, yeah, that ought to be good. Oh, it's going to be a good one. And it because uh, he's, he's got a good sense of humor too. He's hilarious. Yeah. And uh, we have there's so much information that uh, Amar's got. So that that that'll be a fun one. So um, last thing we'll talk about is just some of the trends that we're seeing with uh, some of the newer motorcycles. And and one from especially from the bike that you just came off of to the bike this year on the G6R 1000 electronics yeah it's it's huge the the old gsxr uh, 2009 was the last time they made a major change so it's a lot of years and there's no throttle by wire so there's no you can't the only electronics you could do was with rate by rate of rise on the crank with like a bazaz traction control which is very primitive um the new bike not only is it a lot different but suzuki got a lot of the stuff really right on this bike the the launch control works fabulous the the traction control is really good the stuff that the R model adds with with auto blip and quick shift is really good, but it also requires you to be aware of what you're doing because you can really go the wrong way. We we had an, we've been trying to get decel control, which is engine braking is what more commonly known as with Hayden to work right, and the clutch on the new bike is a throwback to 2005, 2000 earlier than that, 2003. There's no mechanical control with diaphragm springs on the ramping on the clutch. What that means is your slipper clutch does what it does and you as a mechanic can't adjust anything mechanically to make it better it all has to be done with the throttle bodies and that becomes difficult and you have to trial and error because if you do too much the bike pushes the rider into the corner and makes him crash and it's bad so we work really hard on that we made actually made a big step this morning and uh it, it, this place you really need to control engine braking oh yeah it's yeah. really bad the bike likes to come around on you but in general for the electronics I like having the control because I'm comfortable with the electronics, have worked with them for a long time. Um, I have no fear of it, no intimidation. What I just get in there and start messing with the maps. And we're going testing next weekend um, to test some of the electronics with uh, our sponsor, Flashtune. And I'm really looking forward to, to making some progress with it because it can make the difference from it can make the difference from fifth place to second place easily for us. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of electronics. I mean, I, I really like them. And, and what I try to tell clients is you know, I think electronics are fantastic, but but for for me um, and my riders, what we think about is I want to be proactive with the electronics, not so much reactive with the electronics, right? I want to be able to turn it on when I want to turn it on, or I want to be able to control it. Yes, there's times where it'll be reactive because that's what it's also its job is, but I don't want to rely on it to be reactive. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, that's always a good approach. Reactive is n not going to be the most well thought out and productive procedure being proactive i do it all the time here at the track 
whether it's proactive with the officials here, but hey, what, hey, the lights in the, you know, what about this corner? What about that? Or being proactive with the motorcycle itself and being prepared, um, going through everything, going, well, do I need that? Oh, no, I don't need that. Yeah. Or I do need this. And the rider's going to tell you, oh, it didn't work. And then you can, then you can be reactive. Yeah, but, so, so it's funny because that's actually a very much of a life lesson that I use with a lot of, a lot of my clients, which, um, which is being reactive, you tend to be abrupt. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Proactive, you have time to make decisions right. and you can be thoughtful about it and you have time to take your time. Reactive, you're almost late and abrupt. Yes, and, and as you called me, uh, whatever you called me earlier, that I can be that way because- yeah, An uncompromising prick. An yes. uncompromising prick. I don't want to compromise <laughs> the rider's life's in your hands. So I may come off as a prick sometimes, but I, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I care a lot about what's happening and I got to protect my rider. You know, That's what I'm here, here to do. Yeah, so last night on our track, again, I'm just a big fan of them. I think we're going to see big trends um, but I think it also goes back to what you said about taking notes, right? So right. these people, whether it's a street rider or whether it's a track rider, is understanding um, what they're trying to accomplish with those electronic aids um, and, and making sure that they are taking notes with them. Yeah, you do. And and always save your, if you're doing maps, and and so you can get into that, and um, the the new GSXR and the, and the R1 and the Kawasaki, they have a lot of different maps save them in your computer all the time just like you do files for anything you do on your computer and do a backup it's the same sort of procedure very procedure oriented i am and if you save your backups and save your files and you have to you can go back hey that last tuesday or, or last track day this worked now it's not working let me go back and yeah. start over and yeah. that always enables you to do that so always back up your maps great uh rick thank you very much You're i welcome. appreciate that um it's great having you come in here and, and do a little interview with us and uh, I, I know this is this you know, this topic is um, is an interesting one because everybody thinks there's all these special secrets and silver bullets, and we know that there's there's not. No, it's it's follow your procedures and do it every time. That's the biggest step I can give you. And I hope maybe one of these times we can do another one with a little more in depth on one of these particular topics. Yeah, oh, we, I have. Trust me, I have. Uh, I have a long list, and we'll okay. do some more with. Okay. Well, I'll be so. happy to do it. All right, great. Thanks again. Thank you, Ken. Copyright 2017. Ken Hill Coaching. All rights reserved.